So this, in, in this uh, workshop, we're going to talk to you about uh, the work in progress that we do in, um, at Sequoia High School in Redwood City, um, in the high school and in the Redwood City community, um, trying to support undocumented students. Um, my name is Jane Slater. I teach English learners uh, and AVID at Sequoia. I also am the advisor for the school's Dream Club. Um, Hi, I'm Cheryl Munoz Bergman. I'm the director of programs for a nonprofit organization called the International Institute of the Bay Area, and we provide legal services for immigration and citizenship. Um, and I work out of our Redwood City office and have been collaborating with um, Jane and the Sequoia High School Dream Club um, and Redwood City's Immigrant Youth Action Team for the past three years. I'm Hannah Blumengreen. I'm a sophomore, and I just joined the Dream Club this year. My name is Rosemary Ramirez, and I'm a senior at Sequoia High School, and now I've been an active member for the Dream Club for three years. Hello, everyone. My name is Lily. I'm also an E4FC student, um, and I'm also a health educator at Sequoia High School with the Center for Youth, um, and I've been working with the Dream Club and the Immigrant Youth Action Team for the past three and a half years. So just to give you a little idea of of what we're going to try and cover today. We're going to um, basically talk about um, identifying or working with um, or the undoc undocumented population in your school community, um, what we are doing to try to create um, a supportive culture, uh, uh, something uh, a little bit about our club, and then the real benefits, share with you the benefits that we've had of working with some community partners. So first, Cheryl, we'll talk to you a little bit about the undocumented population. So um, <clears throat> obviously you're all here because you're interested in supporting undocumented students that you're working with. Um, a lot of times folks may have certain um, perceptions or misperceptions about who, who are the undocumented students in our, in our schools. So um, it's important to remember that undocumented students not only come from Mexico and Latin America, but from Asia, Pacific Islands, Africa, Europe, from all over the world. Um, and in many families, many immigrant families um, throughout the Bay Area are from what we call mixed status families. So someone in the family might be undocumented, someone in the family might be a US citizen. So, um, and someone might have their green card. And so you might have, um, you know, a lot of times the, the student you know, might be a US citizen, but the parent's undocumented, and so you know, they're facing issues that way. Or sometimes the parent is a US citizen and the student is still undocumented. So it can go both ways, or the older si sibling is undocumented, but the younger sibling might be a US citizen because they're born here. So it's important to kind of expand our perceptions about who might be undocumented, who might not be undocumented. Sometimes we think we're gonna only find our undocumented students in the ESL classes. A lot of us know that that's not true. A lot of undocumented students came here when they were very little and they speak English much better than I do. So, um, you know, it's, it's a very wide range of, um, of folks who could possibly be undocumented. And a general rule of thumb that I always recommend is assume that there's at least one undocumented student in, in every classroom. Um, and when you're sharing information, you don't need to ask students to self-identify like who's undocumented. Just assume that when you're speaking to an audience, some students are gonna be US citizens, some students are gonna be undocumented and share the information that all your students are gonna need. So, you know, if you're telling them about filling out the FAFSA, mention, well, what happens if you don't have a social security number? What happens if you're undocumented? What happens if your parents don't have a social security number? So if you share that information with them, then your students don't have to self-identify, but they can get the information they need to take those next steps. And then this chart just shows that there's a lot of folks who are undocumented in the Bay Area um, in general and in each of the counties where we're, where we're operating. Um, we estimate that we have about 20 to 30 percent of our student population is undocumented. We're in San Mateo County. So, um, that could be, um, you know, so that's several hundred students, and we, we definitely don't touch, on, touch all of them all of the time, but we're, we're working on it. Um, in, in the same way, there's a really big variety of um, types of un, undocumented students, and that you, 
<coughs> there are also is a big variety or a, a range in ways that um, undocumented students are able to identify themselves or do identify themselves. So, so like Ms. Lady was saying, there is a different type of undocumented students and how they address themselves and what they know of their actual status so that you could come across um, students that are uh, undocumented and know that are undocumented and advocate for themselves and like aren't afraid to say I am undocumented. There's those who find out that they are undocumented once they come across when they need a social win in the FAFSA or that kind of. And there's also people that whose parents are afraid to admit that they're undocumented and tell their children to say no, hide it, it's only to ourselves and there's some people that just lost hope that they don't know where it's going to go and like that there's no other way for it just to stay hidden. And now uh, with the deferred action, there's more people that are coming out of lost hope and like are advocating for themselves and saying, oh, well, I'm documented, there's stuff out there for me. And that's what we like you guys to acknowledge that there's more, there's different people and you have to know how to address certain people. And some people are shy about telling their stories and some people aren't. So when, when we're talking about trying to create a um, culture of support, I guess, I guess the first thing is to sort of realize or recognize what a supportive culture is in, uh, in a school. So um, we, we sort of went through and thought about what, what students have been saying to us and what, what makes um, for a positive culture uh, visibly. Yeah, so one example I could bring up is the uh, terms that are used for undocumented students instead of saying illegal students. Um, I know I take it very offensive when someone says that you're an illegal because that's not a term you use for a person. It's undocumented. So know the terminology that follows this issue. Um, and also, if you show the students that you care that you will, can be a supportive person to them, that's helpful. And just if you don't have a gym club by your school, start try to start one or get a number of students to start one and posters around your school always help like to know that it's a AB540 friendly school or classroom if you want to start smaller. I, I think just to, just to um, underline one of the negatives, I, um, one of the things that students have pointed out most, most that, that their friends say about schools um, that aren't supportive is that nobody talks about it at all. And so to, to just completely avoid the issue, although it seems neutral, is actually a really negative um, way to deal with it. Um, and by the same token, the staff, because it's really important to get your staff on board as well, um, the staff needs to feel that they're working in an environment that is supportive of, undo of undocumented students. And if that's their um, feeling, then it's OK to be loud and proud. So. Um, one of the things that, that uh, happens at our school, and our school does have a very supportive culture, is that on uh, regularly, at least yearly, on a staff meeting agenda, the principal will address the idea of uh, uh, something to do with undocumented students. And so in the past, we have had Cheryl come and do a presentation to the staff about legal issues. We've had students from the Dream Club come and tell their stories. We've just we've had the principal just get up and say something supportive about um, a scholarship or students. So sometimes um, complete staff meetings have been devoted to the issue, and sometimes two minutes. But it does it does get brought up. Um, we we also um, make sure that the hallways in our school have some visible information. So there are posters. The guidance office has posters, E4FC posters. Um, our school uses Naviance um, as a college um, application process. And on, I don't, if you're familiar with Naviance, I think most people are at this point. But um, on Naviance, there's a scholarship tab. Um, and our college counselor breaks down one of the categories to AB 540. So as soon as a student clicks onto Naviance to look for scholarships, one of the tabs they can look at is AB 540, and it will sort all the scholarships that. that, that Naviance. It's actually. It's, it's yeah. It's something that your school district would have to buy. It's a. Um, it's not cheap. It's. Uh, but it, I think it's sort of what has become the way that or is becoming, trying to become, the way that schools are um, coordinating with the colleges for the whole application process. 
Um, I, I actually don't know, but that, that's, how, that's how it sort of presented to me. And it's what we use for letters of recommendation for, you know, students all have um, emails and stuff like that. Anyway, um, so I think that's pretty clear. Uh, so the, the, one of the things that we decided to do, or that I decided to do with um, two or three students, maybe six years ago, more than six years ago, um, I, like probably everybody in here, had some students who were uh, applying to college and recognizing that they weren't going to be able to pay for it, and were feeling really sad, um, beyond sad, and frustrated, and ready to give up, and what should they do? Um, because they were undocumented. And I didn't know that much about the issue, but I had heard enough by that time to say, well, I, I, let's try to do something. And, and so we started a club, the three of us, and um, our goal was to sort of support each other and talk about how could we raise some money to, to try and help pay for college. And for the first couple years, it was just a few of us, and we raised just a little bit of money. Um, I mean, we didn't raise any money to give away, actually, because we were in a couple hundred dollars. Um, but we, we built a little starting foundation, and now, six years later, our club has probably 30 club members, um, 15 to 20 coming to one of our twice-weekly meetings, uh, or both of our twice-weekly meetings, uh, we are really active in our school. We're really active in our community. We gave away $10,000 in scholarship money last year. So little by little at first, and then things really started to move. So I, um, I just wanted to share a little bit about how nuts and bolts wise we started the club. Um, or really, I guess, how you start any club. So um, I think Hannah's going to try and talk about that a little bit. So you want to try to get students to join both undocumented and documented. I was personally invited by a friend who was a member of the Dream Club, and beforehand um, I had knew, known a little bit about the challenges undocumented people faced. And it was her invitation that really got me involved with the Dream Club, and I'm glad she asked me. I would strongly encourage documented students to join because it's about supporting your community and your peers. You become more involved in your community and you get to become an advocate. It's an overall great experience and you're helping others while at the same time you're growing as a person yourself. Another way you can get students to join is you can have your Dream Club members present to other classes. We've done this and ended up presenting to all of our AVID classes at our school. You can also have announcements in the Daily Bulletin and collaborate with counselors. So I, I think the point about including documented students is, is really important. Um, it's, it's important that the club is a safe space um, and that, that, that no students are ever called out or have to identify themselves or singled out as undocumented. So we have always had about a half 50, 50 um, percent documented and undocumented students, members in our club. But whenever we do something publicly, the entire group presents as undocumented. So there, there's no, nobody is being singled out and there's a, enough of a safety net there, I think, in terms of, of what people feel. Um, and I, I, I can't say enough for the personal invitation aspect of trying to get kids to, to come to a club. Um, it's basically the only way that they, they end up showing up. Um, it's, it's also really important as a person who's a club advisor to get staff allies. Or, um, at this point, running this club is almost a full-time job. If I didn't have people helping me, I, it, it wouldn't be happening. But um, you know, I have one, one teacher on staff who basically is my co-advisor and comes to all of our meetings and is willing to help in, in any way possible at all times. Um, and a lot of staff members that are just generally supportive. We have a number of staff from our school who are at this conference. Um, a huge number of people went to last year's conference. Uh, people are sort of open, not sort of, people are openly supportive of undocumented students in our school. Um, 
and will come to me for to ask questions if they need resources. Uh, if they they will send students to the club. They will walk students to the club. So uh, that's that's been really useful. They they know if they have a student who has a question that they can call me at this point and. Then I'll call Cheryl and get an answer for them <laughs> to whatever question they might have. So uh, it's also really helpful to have staff members who have other talents or connections or abilities, someone who's really good at making a PowerPoint presentation or somebody who's really good at designing posters or art teachers are really helpful. And you know, a lot of work that we do is just getting stuff out there in public or know somebody who knows how to design t-shirts or has a t-shirt company, all of those things are, are, um, are great resources. Um, let's see. So having long-term and short-term goals within your club, it's always good because you want to show the students that they're, we're not coming just to come and pretty much waste our lunch time. It's to, if you, if you don't have short-term or long-term goals, that's what we students feel, that we're just coming in, we're gonna sit down in a classroom, eat our lunch, and just sit. But if we have some incentive to what, where the club is leading to or where we're heading to, like for example, annual events, presentations, participation at our community, um, then they come with incitement to say, oh, this, um, this week we're gonna do this, and it's gonna happen this, and when, where, and it's always good to know that we're, our hard work is not just going to waste, it's actually producing some, something even better and bringing more students, more resources to them that they have. So one of the uh, short-term and long-term ongoing goals that we have is fundraising. So we like to fundraise all throughout the school year. Um, and that could be through annual events, the dinners that we host, um, or through just donation letters or fundraising letters. So it's good to have those goals. And making the club visible, uh, um, it's also a good resource to attract new members. So having a Facebook page, right now we're in an era where media is like everywhere, like you could just type someone's name and look up everything. So having that accessible to students who um, may go to a school that is not um, friendly to undocumented students um, could help them out as well from the inside the computer, uh, inside the school, knowing them. Uh, and also in your local newspapers or in your school newspapers, it's good to. Your batteries. It's good to um, be open and show your community that you are friendly to undocumented students and have the word out there. Okay, if the battery runs out, we're just going to ad lib because <laughs> it looks like it might happen. Um, so um, you know, we we provided you with some questions just to think about. Um, uh, we know your school is not our school, so what 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 can be done at your school probably? And so I would I would imagine looking at whatever successful clubs that you have at your school are to um, to to see what they're doing to get to get students to come. And as uh, I was saying before, often food is a great uh, beginning incentive, um, something all teenagers are attracted to. Um, but we, we try to do a lot to keep our, our club visible. So we do have the Facebook page. We've made posters. Um, this is the yearbook page, uh, not from this, this last June, but the one before. Um, the, there was a whole page dedicated to the, the Dream Club. Um, and then we do, a t we do a ton of fundraising. So as, as I said, we're now at a point where we're, we're able to give away almost um, $10,000 a year. And about half of that money we raise at our annual event. Uh, four years ago we had an event that maybe 30 people attended. It was just a panel. Um, it was try we were trying to be informational. We weren't, we weren't trying to raise money. Uh, the following year we, we hosted a dinner this past year. This, this was our third uh, dinner event. We made a, about $5,000. We were really fortunate to get local artist Fabiana Rodriguez there to, um, 
to be our keynote speaker. She also worked with our students a little bit earlier in the year to produce some artwork that we were able to sell at our event. Um, so this is our big fundraiser. We get, the, we get everything donated. A, an alumni owns a taqueria and he donates the food. Uh, one of our students this year works, his parents work in a catering agency and they donated the tablecloths. The, the labor comes from the students um, in our community group. We, uh, parents make the aguas and the desserts. So uh, we, we try to get as many people to chip in. We had a, a local printing company print uh, um, our flyers, our programs for us. Um, we just ask a lot of people to do a lot of things. Um, an, another, and they say yes. And they do say yes. Another uh, uh, major fundraising technique for us has been um, through people on the staff. Now, now, we're so public and we're so visible. So in the past few years, we've had um, staff members put the Dream Club as one of the options on their uh, wedding gift registry. Um, we've had birthday parties where please don't bring a gift, bring, make a donation. Um, staff members having that. We've had um, just recently a, a, t a guidance advisor who was going to have a b baptism for her baby son. Um, instead of giving baptismal gifts, donated the money to the club. A student had a wine taste. A uh, teacher. A, student, <laughs> a teacher had a, a wine tasting um, with donated wine and donated the proceeds to the club. So in, in that way, we've been actually making quite a bit of money as well. And so sort of everybody is on board. Not, not everybody, but a lot of people. Yes. That's a good question. I, I, it, things seem to have worked themselves out. To tell you the truth, when we first, the whole reason I first became involved with E4FC was because we started getting those that money in the very beginning, $100 here and $100. It was really $20 here, $20 there. And I had like $300, and, and our principal told me the same thing. And I, I called Kathy, who I didn't know. Uh, but someone had told me about her, and I said, we have this money, we want to start a scholarship fund, can you help us? And they actually housed the money for us at first. I mean, I don't think that that's, I, I, I'm not going to recommend that as an option. First, first of all, their, their um, fiscal group is, is a little bit harder, and you're going to lose a big percentage of your money now. At, something happened, and all of a sudden now it, it's okay at our school. Um, and, and I don't know how, how that worked. We also have a foundation. I don't know, you know, I think a lot of schools have foundations and if your foundation will work with you, um, th that's another way. Oh, yes. Well, I want to kind of hear a little bit more from the students because um, I'm trying, I, I've contemplated creating a dream club at my school and I, I love the suggestion students that are interested, a couple, two to three students, and they have friends, they invite them personally, say, hey, you should help out this, this will really help me and you, knowing that it's just not benefits for undocumented students, but it's benefiting for documented students too, because it helps all of us in the long run. So that one-on-one -on -one saying, hey, come to the club meeting, that really 
at least it has worked out for me and I know Hannah because that's how she started off. So that's one way. And then just making posters to say um, the Dream Club meets when and where and that's it. Like simple posters like that and it seems to work because we've been growing year by year. So If you have Avid, um, I, that's a really good feeding ground just because it tends to be, it is a mix of undocumented and documented students and they're motivated and sort of, you know, try, trying to move along and they want to do community service. And I mean, our, our club is a big community service club. I mean, it's serving our own community, but the kids are doing a lot of work. Um, so they benefit, I sort of advertise it in that way as well. But, but I think our, our the bulk of our club comes from AVID classes because we've done presentations in AVID and when the first groups that I had, I just went, was talking to specific AVID groups and, and that's how you get your documented kids in there as, as well. Um, and it pays off for everybody. As we were saying in the last session, our last year's co-presidents, one was documented and one was undocumented. They're super involved, and one of them got the Hurtado full ride at Santa Clara, the undocumented student, and the documented student got a Gates Millennium Scholarship. And I wrote both of their community service letters for those scholarships, so. Um. You could just advertise the skills that they're gonna gain, right? The leadership skills that they're gonna gain. So um, again, kind of going back with the whole community service aspect, but, and also trying to get documented students um, in there, you could pitch it that way. Um, so it's not solely like, oh, if you join this group, you're outing yourself as an undocumented person, but sort of include that youth development component within the group, within the club, um, which a lot of it happens. We have amazing students who are just far beyond that. I mean, they come in and they're already ready to present, but you could sort of pitch it in that way. You'll gain presentational skills, leadership skills, um, all sorts of different things. And I think this is dying, but um, our slide was sort of the, the benefits of collaborating with community, with the community, with the broader community. And um, my organization, the organization that I work for is actually based at Sequoia High School, so we're part of a teen resource center. Um, but really kind of just going back to the conversation that um, Jose Antonio Vargas was um, leading and some of the things that came up. Um, that I thought were very um, important, very just realistic. Just look at the resources that are around in your community, right? Um, and, and link up with them because um, as educators, right, you're, you're, I mean, you have a curriculum to follow. You're already bombarded with a lot of different responsibilities that you have to do. So it's really important to link to the community that you're, that you're serving and make sure that you know what resources are available so that you are able to provide other resources that you may not um, know of or that you, you know, I mean, sometimes we have students or I have students come in and say like, I, my family can't pay for food. How do we, you know, like my dad just got deported or, you know, some situation like that. And there's definitely organizations out in the broader community. I mean, I can't, I don't have those resources, right? But I can connect that student to a broader, um, to an outside community that can support that student with that. And really, it's just about making sure that we, that we highlight this issue as a community issue. Right? Again, it's not a Latino issue. It's not, I mean, it really does impact the entire community. Um, so really trying to engage um, the people from the broader community to, um, to get involved. And uh, what we do is we host monthly meetings where we just invite, anybody could come, anyone. You don't have to be an organizational leader. It could be anybody. And, um, and really just try to um, get those organizational leaders to um, stay involved. And there's definitely something more formal, some, some more of a formal group that we've been able to um, um, sustain for um, for our group, which is a collaborative, I mean, as you're, as you're seeing right here, right, it's not the adults presenting. It's a youth and adult partnership. Um, and that's really the model that we, ha that, that we have followed um, that really goes with um, the broader, I mean, we have a list and we'll go through a couple of them just to kind of give you an idea of what organizations you can link up. I mean, we, we have 
the Redwood City librarian who comes and helps um, with the club. So there's definitely a variety of different things. Um, so that's just kind of to show you a list of, of what that looks like. Um, so these are some of the groups in our local Redwood City community who have formed um, this immigrant youth action team. And this is part of an initiative, kind of a, a broader initiative called Redwood City 2020, which is a community-based initiative supporting um, uh, children, youth, and their, and their families um, in our community. But there's a lot of community groups. So they're not necessarily, you know, immigrant focused organizations like the you know the um, youth librarian participates on a regular basis the boys and girls club participates so there's because there's such a high immigrant population in our communities so if there's a youth serving organization they're probably serving a lot of immigrant youth as well as you know non-immigrant youth but engaging them in these efforts has been um, I'd say it's been easier than than we might have thought um, and the, the idea of forming an immigrant youth action team actually came up from this broader initiative because enough people kind of raised the concern like, you know what, I have a lot of immigrant students, immigrant youth in my group and I don't know how to answer all their questions or I don't know who to turn to. And so we kind of decided to put a little bit more focus on this, on this issue and, and really form a strong collaboration with the Sequoia High School Dream Club so that we could bring the resources to where the youth actually are. Um, so, um, in your community, um, there's, you know, it might not be these same organizations. So the questions for you would be, you know, to think about who, who are the people um, who are champions of immigrant youth in my community? What, uh, what are the organizations that are doing this kind of work? And what kind of connections um, might you be able to, um, to, to build there um, so that you can kind of support each other and, and meet your goals? And one specific example of this that I wanted to just highlight with, um, you know, a, a lot of you are probably at, you know, one of the earlier presentations about deferred action for immigrant youth or DACA. Um, you know, there's a lot of community-based organizations throughout the Bay Area who are really trying to support immigrant youth as they're applying for this important immigration benefit. And um, so if you're not knowing, like if you want to like start to bring resources to students in your area and you don't know maybe who else is out there in the community or where to turn, um, I put down the contact information of my, um, my coworker, Briar Goldberg, who's the project, coordinate, project coordinator for the Bay Area DACA initiative. And she can let you know from Sonoma to Santa Cruz who are the organizations in your um, in your local community that are providing some of these resources. Um, you know, we, you know, so my nonprofit organization, the International Institute, we provide legal services and we, you know, one of our best, you know, workshops we, for, for deferred action, we did at Sequoia High School and collaborated with um, the Dream Club and were able to use the, um, the, the um, computer lab at the high school to actually fill out the applications for, 57 students in one night and got them all out in the mail. So it's, 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 a, it's a great way that we can meet um, um, some of the community goals by working together. Um, so I think the, the biggest accomplishment, maybe uh, or physical accomplishment, of the Immigrant Youth Action Team really is this annual event that, that um, I, I was telling you about. So I, I do have some copies of the programs if anybody wants one just to see. But um, just just to show you this program and let you know a little bit about what it is and that uh, are a little to explain that it's a huge amount of work, but it's also one of those program uh, one of those projects that we all have to work together on. And there's definitely things for everybody at every level level. Um, so a student who's able to put in one hour a week or just show up for the event and help set up or a student who wants to work four hours a week with us and, be meet, and, meet, and come to all of the planning meetings and have the input on what the agenda is going to look like, doesn't you know all, all different levels of student participation and at the same time, a, you know a lot of participation from adults from all over the community. Um, there's no way that a school club by itself, I think, could put on such a big to put on such a big event. We have 250 people show up for for this dinner. So between um, all of our work and, and the, what, the resources that people are able to bring in and the connections to bring people from the community who might not otherwise 
see our advertising is, is, is a big deal. And at, at this point, our, um, the students go to the school board every year and invite the board to come to this event. And our um, superintendent and assistant superintendent both brought their wives to the dinner this year. They, um, the student trustee who doesn't go to our school came to the event and then reported out at the next board meeting, apparently, about how much he got out of going to this event and um, how, he, how much he learned. And it was really a big, um, you know, it was in the board minutes. So um, that was the, that was The mayor of Redwood City oh, yeah, was the, there, gave the welcome. Oh, yeah, the, the mayor. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that is that. Um, at last year's event, we had, um, We've got a representative from Congresswoman Anna Esch's office to give, to present um, a certificate of recognition. Um, and while Hannah speaks, I'll scroll through some artwork. We had uh, one of our local artists, Fabiana Rodriguez. She's a political artist. You may know her. We got her to come to Sequoia and host a free two-day workshop in which students could come and create their own political prints. So we had lots of fun doing that. She talked to us about how art can be powerful and we can use art to convey messages to the audience. And it was overall a really neat experience. It was hands-on. And a lot of people showed up and it turned out really well. So what ended up happening also, um, you're probably wondering, oh, how, how did we get this political <laughs> artist in there, right? Um, one of our community um, organizational leaders wrote um, the, um, was able to write the, um, the, grant the grant application, I'm sorry, the grant application, we got the grant and we got Fabiana to come and, um, and help um, with, the, with the event. She, she was a speaker at the event and of course, help with the students. And then we used the, uh, the art and sold it at the event. So that was also how we were able to gain some funds. Um, I'm, I'm unclear about the staff time and the requirements to get a club done. So obviously people are here to see about replicating this model. How much does it cost, you know, um, in terms of staff time and whatever budgetary items folks should be considering when they're planning in their next school year to start this, if you can give us some idea of that. If teacher, students or teachers who want to start a club can start a club, basically, mm -hmm. as long as they fill out a, a little bit of paperwork for the ASB. Um, and then you decide when you want to meet, and How much teacher do time is, like, what's, what's the idea of how much teacher time does it take? To, you know, on a regular basis, like how, how It takes a huge amount of time, is what I would say to you. I mean, <laughs> I, it's, I, I mean, just, I, I need to be honest. It, yeah, it depends on what you want to do. Like, if you want to have a club where students come once a week and you sort of meet and talk about how you're feeling and here's a list of scholarships or something, you, I mean, I think that's a useful thing to do and it's probably not, not that much time. If you, you know, if you say, I'm going to raise thousands of dollars in scholarship money or I want to get involved in the community and participate or I want I want to make sure that every kid in the school knows what's going on all of this it starts to become you know beyond what you could beyond what you could do mm -hmm. so uh, we meet twice a week so it's two lunch times a week that that's happening as a, as a school club and it's only because we always have big big projects that we're working on the immigrant youth action team meets once a month, so that's a one hour after school. Um, whenever one of our projects is coming up, we're meeting extra time because we need more time to prepare for these these projects. Um, you know, trying to stay involved in the community involves going out. We do presentations in the community, so there's evenings. There's um, so you sort of draw the limit where you can. I mean, everybody has a different limit, I, th I think. And um, you know, as I was saying before, if I didn't have this this other teacher who were willing to cover sometimes for me, I don't think we could do everything. Mm -hmm. And at this point, we send students out on their own. Um, you know, there was just something at College of San Mateo recently, and it's like neither of us could go. 
and a couple of students said they could, and okay, good luck. Um, <laughs> so uh, it, that you know, that in terms of time is the big, the big thing. In terms of budget, there's no budget that the, the school is certainly not going to give us any money. Um, so we create our own budget with our fundraising, and, and our fundraising money is for scholarships. Mm -hmm. So, Well, I just want to commend you all on that, this fantastic job, because I've seen and heard of dream clubs in other areas where they've been able to kind of secure grant money and stuff to run a budget, and, and you know, and you guys are doing this on, on love and, and bare bones, and I really, it's just amazing. Well, we're, we're starting to get money, too. See, that's the thing. Once, once you start to get out there and do this, we're able to apply for grants because you, you get one thing done, you have something to put on your grant proposal as, you know. So it does, it's just baby steps. And, and foundations are looking to support this. Program. They are. Oh, yeah, they absolutely. are. Yeah. It is, or to talking about what things we would want to do, w want to do next. Do and they also have dedicate time to like just talking about issues that are coming in into the space. And yeah, we're not. Yeah, we're not as much of an emotional support club as we could be. Um, although we try to provide a, a space for that or access. Um, Every once in a while, I feel like I, mean, I think in and of itself, because we exist, it, there's a certain amount of emotional support. Um, I. I I think we do a little bit of uh, education. This is what DACA. It, it, this is what DACA is. This is what the California Dream Act is like. You know, I sort of went through that with everybody in the beginning of the year because people didn't know. But um, and we also part of the work that we do when we're getting ready for the annual event is we do creative writing. So we um, help true. the students develop their stories. So a lot of the emotional support comes within that. Um, I, I don't know if you got a chance to either go to the creative writing workshop um, here or the mental health, but there's definitely a lot of connection between those two. And um, A4FC is working towards a mental health guide for undocumented students. So um, there's definitely a lot of work to be done in that area, but we're very aware that that's an area that needs to be that we need to start advocating for that. So, um, but I think it's really very important for students to, yeah, have that space and that time to sort of, and if they're comfortable, of course. Um, I think even even within our club, when we were preparing for our event, and and students were practicing telling their stories, and it was, it, and things that they had written and rehearsed. I, I know one student just came in. It was probably her second meeting, and ended up saying. Even though she knew what the club was, and even though she knew what it was for, after she heard a couple of students telling their story, she, she was surprised. You know, like, wow, what she said is, they're passing through the same things I am, or something. And um, so it, it's true that we probably should do more of that um, in, in terms of support. I, we, um, can I just I'm say one thing bef before people leave? Just a little. Um, Plug, do you want to say this? Um, yeah, so this year our new project we added to our club is hosting our, our a conference for undocumented students and peer allies. So um, it's a conference um, that's happening on March 9th uh, from 9 to 3 p.m. It's similar background to this um, where we have a general session and workshops in between on what colleges are AB 540 friendly, um, emotional health, how to deal with or cope with your problems that regard being undocumented or having friends that are undocumented. And it's just uh, a work in progress right now into what workshops we're going to offer, but those are two off the head. And we invite you guys all. And right now you can actually register online. The, the website's on the paper you're handing out, and anyone's welcome, and it's free, and we are providing lunch, so. We really mm -hmm. invite you to invite your students. It's, 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 a, it's yeah. a conference for, for students. Although you're, of course, welcome to come, but, um, but it's, we're, we're trying to provide a, a place for students to network and get a little information, and know that I mean, we're not working in isolation, and we, we don't want anyone else to be. We'd, we'd like to be able to connect with more high school students. So 
Like Please a mini pass version of a mini version of this, exactly. but for the high school students themselves, because they don't necessarily have the kind of peer support that, that they could use. <coughs> okay, I was sorry. just going to ask, um, what were some of the grants that you all applied to? The so the San Francisco Foundation, mm -hmm. they had a, a like a mini grant for arts. Um, that we were able to get, and that's how we did um, the, the printmaking workshop with Fabiana. And last year we had applied for that same set of funding and did um, video, video storytelling, a video story project where the youth created their own um, stories. And um, yeah, so that, and then the money, the money for the creative writing stories? And the yeah, so a little bit of the funding comes from um, Rabbit City 2020, right? Which we talked about earlier, which is this big effort um, made up of many organizations within the county. So it's, it's, it's supported by, by the county a little bit. Yeah. We, we also just got um, some money from the Wesley Foundation. Um, I, I don't think that's their common policy, but we submitted a, Video. They. It's a twenty thousand dollar. We didn't get twenty thousand. It's a twenty thousand um, dollar scholarship, or not scholarship. It's a twenty thousand dollar grant. You submit a one minute YouTube video. Um, we sort of did it on why not, um, and I don't. And they liked our sub. They they didn't like our submission twenty thousand dollars, but they <laughs> they gave us two thousand dollars. So they so. Um, it's worth just applying to yeah. things. And, uh, yeah. So if you have a local community foundation, that's a good place to go. Um, or also, like a lot of the stuff that we've done, kind of we tie it to the arts in some kind of a way because that's a good way to get the the expression out and to tell the story to the broader community anyway. So kind of arts, arts and education related stuff um, that could also be a good fit. Yeah. 